Hey everybody, welcome to the Dreamer's Edge Podcast. This is Chris, uh, writer for the site and subtitle editor. This is Eric, teacher, sometimes writer. And I am Dimitri, editor-in-chief of Idiomatic.com and movie critic. And we've reached the point in our like year-long project now, a little <laughs> bit longer than a year. Yeah, they're about, huh? Yeah. Uh, where we not reached... that it was a difficult project, we just can't coordinate. <laughs> that was pretty much it. We've reached the fifties. Uh, for those of you who haven't been following, we've been going down the decades, listing our top three movies of each of those decades, and we've reached the last decade where we'll be doing that. Because after that, we'll do a special series of episodes about the rest. Yeah. But the 50s is the last decade we're doing. But the reason why we're stopping is, I think it's because the 50s, like, just sort of, like, reached that point where we're like, hey, we're just listing classics now. Yeah. That's pretty much what's For going sure. on. Yeah, it's not like we're going down in any type of rabbit hole of, you know, look how cool I am, I know this movie. It's just like, no. <laughs> you know, they're classics, and you know them, and you like them for a reason. This is what it comes down to. Yeah. So. Yeah. Although that might be a little bit of the 50s, though. By that point, like, the Hollywood machine had sort of cemented itself in terms of formula like musicals were popping in uh, all the time and it was it's so it was a very formulated decade for cinema and that might be a little bit of the reason why we're like you know <laughs> well you know you've got an entire generation returning from a war you know and the advent of a little bit more of that suburban culture so to speak you know and part of that was you know your weekend going out to the movies you know and certainly hollywood is right there giving you something to watch you know <laughs> So, you know, and they did a good job. They turned it into a major industry. The 50s was also the time, the invention of the car. So it was the first time you basically got, like, teenagers driving out on their own. You know, so it's also the, the invention of the date movie. You know? Right. You know, so already, you know, you've got this element of, you know, the drive-in, the this, the that. And you really do see, a, like, pretty much a movie for every culture, every, you know, every niche in a way, you know. And the other side of it is also just this sense of, like, the fear of the bomb. Right. That really hung over that entire generation. So it's just like there's this sense of unease and paranoia and violence that just might erupt anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. that I find in a way the noir tradition, whether it's the detective or not, you know, almost kind of taps into that as well as just kind of like this underscore of fear and, you know, paranoia with the general population. Mm. Without further ado, Eric, why don't you get us started? Okay, so uh, I'll start number three all the way to number one. So number three, Seventh Seal. The Seventh Seal by uh, Ingmar Bergman. It's in black and white, as most of the 50s movies are. Uh, it takes place during the plague, the Black Plague in Europe. And it's this man that's asking all these questions about life and death. And he's playing chess against the Grim Reaper. And it's kind of interesting because the Grim Reaper is right there, all in black with this very somber face. And at first, he's kind of jokey, and then when we see him later on, he starts to become more and more menacing. Um, it, I, I like Bergman a lot. I think uh, the man was definitely a genius. And it's the movie that I, I always like more. I like Wild Strawberries. I like all of his, all of his films. But that one, I don't know why there was something. There was a high energy, and when I read up on it, he said that that was a fun movie he made during the summer with his friends, oh. and you feel it. You definitely feel it when it's up on the screen, and it's kind of a dark thing, too, yeah. you know, having the Grim Reaper chase you. It was kind of like the prelude to Final Destination. <laughs> <laughs> Bill and Ted's. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, no, actually, I didn't know that about um, the backstory there, so it's that's kind of interesting because it's it's a good movie for sure. It's um, and it, but it's something that I've always thought of as like these just these big moving parts, like very allegorical. Yeah, you know, and not terribly deep in a way. You know what I mean? Like it's no, just like, sure. but just kind of beautiful and interesting and really kind of enjoyable to watch. You yeah. know, like like meaning not deep in terms of like, I don't know what I mean by that, but it's just in terms of nuance. You know, like. These are the parts. Everything's being given to you, and I, I think the black and white actually helps in this case. You know, and the, and the shadows and the silhouettes and everything. So you get this sense of like the medieval paintings, and it all lends to that um, you know bigger than life feel to it. And yeah, no, it's a really good movie. Uh, my second one would be Sunset Boulevard by Billy Wilder, which uh, interestingly enough. 
Chris, you're the one that gave me the the copy of the film, and I watched it. And it's about this uh, this writer that uh, basically has no money. Somebody's about to repossess his cars. The repo mans are after him, and his car breaks down. He goes into this weird place, uh, this weird no, Sunset Boulevard there, and into this gigantic rundown house that looks like a weird museum and he meets a, a very famous silent movie actress and within this just because he keeps chasing the money he gets into this really weird complex uh, relationship with her and she keeps saying that she's going to do her comeback and everything uh, Billy Wilder who's known for very you know he did some like it hot before that and then he comes into with sunset boulevard and it's such a blow to the hollywood system like he's really it's very satirical it's very morton as a as a film and it's brilliant it has incredible lines throughout and just the story itself uh you get to feel something for this really crazy uh raging actress but that had like her glory days and all of a sudden like she kind of uh, dwindles down it's incredible the complexity that you actually feel for a lot of these characters it's just such a great heart in a way and it always reminded me of the great gatsby like that mm. older woman who basically time stops you know like when her husband leaves her or dies on the white night i can't remember gloria swanson but Basically, she's just like this weird crone surrounded in this house of, you know, just basically mementos to this wedding that never happened. Mm-hmm. You know? And and here you've got this case of basically this woman who, you know, time has kind of stopped. The, the world has moved on. But as long as she stays in this house, <laughs> she can continue with this fantasy that, you know, she is going to conti- have this comeback. She will have this comeback. And if she steps out the door, then probably she'll be proven wrong. Right. <laughs> and there's a lot of interesting things too because uh, some of these actors was it Eric von Strahein who plays the butler was actually a very famous silent movie uh, director he actually directed Gloria Swanson who used to be a huge star in the silent movies and he directed her big flop and they both hated each other and then they, they buried the hatchet to make that film together and Gloria Swanson was huge so she was already a has-been when she made that movie so there was a lot of you know we're we're talking about postmodernism and everything else this was one movie that said here we go yeah she doesn't just look the part she kind of is the part exactly and she's playing cards with Buster Keaton and all of these silent movie actors that are very well known and this is all happening in 1950s that Kind of like the expendable with the, all the action heroes that uh, we see, we get the we get the joke. Except it doesn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, the expendables should just stick around to stick to playing cards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, it's a very creepy movie. Has some very funny moments, uh, but altogether just brilliant. Yeah, no, it's a really good choice and uh, a great gift of mine. Yeah, it was actually <laughs> <laughs> one of the few. <laughs> I'm glorious standard definition DVD. So yeah, and my number one, and uh, I've seen this film easily ten, fifteen times. Still love it. Rear Window by Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah, I, I like love that you qualify it as by Alfred Hitchcock, as opposed to the Rear Window directed by. Jerry Monsoli. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if we're talking about Psycho, you would have to qualify it. <laughs> exactly. And I'm glad to say they never needed to make a remake of it, just because well, it was real. Well, no, I think I, I, I've seen the remake of it. It was called Disturbia and yeah. starred Shia LaBeouf. Yeah, I know, but that one was more teenager-y. And, but, uh, no, this this one is kind of like the perfect movie, in a sense. Uh we get uh, Jimmy Stewart. That's uh, he's stuck in a wheelchair, and he all he has he has no TV, obviously. So he has his binoculars, and he has like his camera because he's a photographer, and he keeps peeking at all of his neighbors. Uh, 
and he kind of makes up stories. And then there's uh, one night he hears a scream and he imagines that one of his neighbors killed somebody and he becomes obsessed with it. And he's sure that he killed him and he kind of ropes in like his girlfriend, Grace Kelly. Right. Who is absolutely gorgeous, stunning in that film. My God, she was beautiful. And uh, th- that's why I recommend it. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For sure. Oh, yeah. Keep going back to watch it. No, no, seriously. There's this great close-up where she comes in through the haze and you can tell why Hitchcock made a close-up. I mean, what a face. That sexually harassed her. Yeah. <laughs> All the actors are really up their games. They're just so good. And the, the plot is very interesting. And we all had that moment of looking at our neighbors, looking through the... Uh, Speak well, for yourself, buddy. Well, I wasn't there with binoculars, but, you know, you can walk down the street and you see somebody in the living room or and you make up stories about them. Oh, what is it that they do? What's their profession? Oh, I, I wonder. Uh, so, obviously, it takes it a bit further, but that's what I liked about the film. And um, I found, like, it's one of the... Definitely one of the best by Hitchcock, in my opinion. I mean, there's great movies in the 50s by Hitchcock, North by Northwest, Vertigo. Uh, but uh, that one is definitely my favorite. I think it's such a great premise to begin yeah. with. It's the thing about it. It's Like you say, it's, it's, it's very relatable, but it's also all the pieces are for the drama are there right at the front. It's like he's vulnerable. He can't do anything, so you have that feeling of helplessness. Uh, you have the feeling also that if trouble comes past that window into his home he's screwed because you know he's injured and you have the whole thing of trying to get people to understand what you're saying and believe you and that level of helplessness all of this is right there in the first sentence of the premise it's it, all the building blocks are right there right away and that's sort of really interesting yeah and also he's doing something wrong by you know by spying on his neighbors so there's also like this sin that comes back to bite you in the butt you know it's all there and in terms of just cinema, you know what I mean? It's just, it's a movie about watching and interpreting and it's just like, it plays so well and cleverly with that premise. You know, it's like you're being led by the hand in terms of like, you know, mm-hmm. basically how to watch a movie in a way. And actually it's a movie that I guess I find like, you know, if we're talking about these older movies, you know, the, um, you know, certainly there's a different pace to them. Yeah. yeah. And this one as well, but I think the pace really, really works. You know, and, and just because it, it is a lot of waiting, and it's a lot of watching, and, you know, it lends itself to that feeling, you know, so you don't miss the faster cuts that you might get, you know, in the movies nowadays. Yeah. Well, I think what helps is, like, you mentioned Grace Kelly as someone that you that really struck you in the movie, but, like, uh, Stuart, uh, Jimmy Stewart... So likable. He's so likable, but and, and his distress, his, his yeah. increasing level of panic and helplessness... Is almost palpable, and he's so entertaining to watch on that yeah. level. Because really, like you're spending a lot of times watching just his face and like the fake sweat on his <laughs> brow and all of that. But he's so convincing, and more to the point, so entertaining to watch as he's slowly losing his shit about this. I know, and he's always like in his pajamas, and uh, you know, there he is with his broken leg. And I forget the the woman that plays uh, the nurse as well. Like she's a bit the comic relief, but she's great playing with uh, Jimmy Stewart. Mm-hmm. They have a good, how can I say, banter between them. So I really like that. Yeah, I'm trying to think if we really have, you know, because I've chosen a movie with Jimmy Stewart as well. You know, and you you can't really get away from him in the fifties. Is what it comes <laughs> down to, you know. Well, but here's like a decorated fighter pilot. You know, like he comes back. You know, he. Yeah is a Hollywood mega star, you know, <laughs> and, you know, like, do we have anyone who's really can do a movie like this one where you're not doing too much that, you know, we really want to just watch on a big screen? Like, do we have a star in that way? You know what I mean? Maybe like, George Clooney. I was going to say George Clooney is the only one I could think of because I was he, thinking the, Ameri- is it the, the American or whatever it is, you yeah. know, like, like where really you just watched him build a gun for most of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, that's as close as I can get to, like, wanting to spend time with someone's face. You know? But you know what? We were mentioning, like, acting in the 50s. I think we need to mention Brando and James Dean because they're the ones that really changed a lot of acting as we know it now. And you see it, they're right there in the 50s. On the waterfront, it's not 
it's not that good of a movie, but Brando is just brilliant in it. He throws everything, just the convention of it and just the natural way that he does the scene. The famous scene in the car where, uh, you know, I could have been a contender and the whole thing. And the the, uh, the director wanted him to be frightened when he sees the gun that his brother pulls. And he just looks at him going like, I'm disappointed. I'm embarrassed for both of us. Because he knows it's his brother. He knows his brother's never going to shoot him. And he's embarrassed. He starts the scene off that way. And it's brilliant. It's so natural. And that completely changed. It took a while, but... That was that was something that changed the acting. Oh sure, no, Brando changed acting into a much more naturalistic uh, yeah. type of perform- performance. But it's it's interesting, interesting to note that because that's not what Jimmy Stewart did in no. any of yeah, his yeah. movies. Uh, he right, he right. was great in it. Yeah. He he was a, definitely a good actor as well. But it wasn't as natural, for sure. But that was not the style of no, acting exactly. that they would learn. <clears throat> no, that's it. It's, it's... No, you got the sense that Jimmy Stewart was saying a line. Being yeah. well directed, yeah. and you know that's what you got. You know, whereas Brando, you you know those were the lines that he kind of came up with on the spot. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, for sure. Well, I, I think that back then the idea of watching a character wasn't as off putting as it is today. And I was like, oh, I can see the construct. I hate that. But like back then, you're supposed to see the construct. Mm-hmm. And Jim, getting it back to Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart. The way he conveys the construct is what's interesting and what's compelling, as opposed to what Brando brought, where it's like, I don't see the construct anymore. I see a real human being. Exactly. And there's the great scene with Brando on the waterfront where he's walking with this the is girl. Like a complete backdoor recommendation. <laughs> I know. Right? <laughs> and then I keep trying to bring it back, and he's like, I won't have it. I won't have it. Yeah, I know, but I just want to mention the scene. <laughs> I just want to mention <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is great scene. <laughs> hey, which movie? Where he, he's sitting on the swing set with the girl. She dropped a, her. Jimmy Stewart? <laughs> no, Brando. George Clooney. <laughs> Follow along here. Come on. Stay with me. And she dropped the glove. He picks up the glove. And Jimmy Stewart would have probably handed the glove to her. He Brando just keeps the glove in his hand. And then he puts on the glove. As if, like, he's just listening to her and kind of, like, playing with the glove. And it's something natural that... Uh, Jimmy Stewart would probably would have done whatever the director asked him to do. Exactly. So. While Brando just meh, did it. But it's, yeah, it's an interesting thing to see this shift kind of starting to happen in the 1950s. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my, um, my list now and I'm going to jump right into the Jimmy Stewart one to get that out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> but Is it, it Jimmy Stewart or Brando? So, no, no, no Brando. I just created the joke because I was waiting for him to say I was like, but Brando, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because my first choice was actually on the waterfront, but you know, I, <laughs> but I guess I can't talk about it anymore. Um, I never recommended the film. <laughs> um, over to you, Eric. <laughs> um, yeah, so 1950 came out with Harvey. It's um, basically it's a, it's a film by Henry Coster. It's based on a play. But it doesn't quite feel that way. At least it didn't to me when I watched it on PBS <laughs> for the first time when I was a kid. Um, and I've watched it since, and the movie just strikes me as like quite whimsical at times, but it's actually quite dark on several levels in, in an interesting way, possibly dealing with mental illness or possibly like an addiction of some sort as an allegory. Basically, this guy, um, played by Jimmy Stewart, is followed around by a six-foot-tall rabbit that no one else can hear or see. And they're just best friends. The insistence that this rabbit is real eventually gets his family to put him into an um, an insane asylum. Hijinks ensue. (laughs) Love is found. (laughs) The family comes closer together. And it sounds like such a strange premise. Weird and farcical. And it's the type of movie that I'm almost surprised in my vision of what the 50s were. You know, it's you've got the sci-fi stuff and you know your robots and this and that. But like... This is just kind of a weird movie <laughs> with like a strange premise right away that you're just supposed to buy. 
and it works really, really well, largely because of, because of Jimmy Stewart. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but I certainly... I haven't. I mean, like, you gave the list, and I was like, oh, I should probably find a way to get that on my Netflix queue. And then I realized I'm not subscribed on Netflix. Uh, but I, I did see uh, its remake, Donnie Darko, and... <laughs> yeah. Yes, well... <laughs> But yeah, no, if you can get your hands on it, for sure, watch it. It's certainly, it's not a, not a hard one to track down, but um, it's, it's a good one. Yeah, well, it's, it's a movie that makes it in a lot of lists of underrated classics. And whatnot. It's, it's a movie that's sort of, because of its odd premise, I think probably skews away from the, you know, AFI lists. And yeah, no, 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 for sure. I, I don't think I ever would have watched it, if you know what I mean. Like, had it not been just like one of those random PBS weekends, you know, like with yeah. the family you know and it's just like and they showed it and and my mother said oh i remember watching that and you know so we actually talked about the movie and you know so there's always that memory of it and eventually like renting it on vhs <laughs> years <laughs> later you know on my own you know with my own pocket money you know what i mean like certainly i, I enjoyed it a lot my next choice <laughs> is obviously um again skewing pretty closely to the type of thing i'll, I'll often recommend with these lists um but it's a 1951 film Again, just like you can't get away from Jimmy Stewart, you can't get away from Hitchcock. So this is my Hitchcock movie. It's Basically, it's based on a novel written by Patricia Highsmith, um, which if you haven't read it, certainly track that down. And it was basically, I think it was her second book as a young woman, and she sold it for like a ridiculously low amount of money. Like in a Hitchcock, being the evil genius he was, like basically had like six or seven different like people making the purchase so that she wouldn't ask for more money. So she never knew it was going to be a Hitchcock movie. And, you know, she never liked him after that is what it comes <laughs> down to. Not that she liked very many people, but the premise of the book itself is two people randomly meet on a train, start talking, and each of them has a grievance in their life, largely based on one person. And, you know, obviously the discussion goes, the drinks are happening. Like, wouldn't life be easier if I got rid of this person? Oh, my God, you actually said it. I've been thinking it. Why don't we do this? You kill my person, I kill your person, no one will ever find us. And it's since then a trope that's been taken up several times in very different manners. And you Yeah, know, Castle, uh, the show Castle did... Uh, yeah, yeah, but Castle rips off every yeah, detective Yeah, exactly. Story that's, ever, yeah. That's, that's a shtick. Yeah. yeah. But this was the first time it was done on the big screen and, you know, as an idea, you know, the um, certainly it kind of like haunts you a little bit you know and it's kind of scary because a it deals with like the anonymity of like public transportation in a way like what what if you were to just make a connection what's the clue there is none you know and then basically you just it's the evil version of before sunrise <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> they've got and then they get together seven years later <laughs> 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 and so obviously things don't go quite as well as you would think. <laughs> one person can't go through with it, the other one does, you know, and, you know, things go out of control pretty quickly. Um, but it's, it's just a very good movie. The actors uh, really pull it off. No, no real big names there, at least none that I really followed anywhere else, but um, certainly track it down. It's one of the lower scale, like, Hitchcock movies, you know, certainly not a rear window or anything like that. But it's actually the premise itself that I found always kind of haunting. Oh, I agree. Well, and, and that's the strength of the premise. Like this one's based on a book, but it's funny because you, when you watch Hitchcock movies, uh, um, allow me to talk about uh, on the waterfront. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was actually I was thinking of Rope all of a sudden. Like when you watch, oh, uh, I was going to talk at length about Vertigo. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the sense that Hitchcock spends an awful lot of time trying. Wait, wait, wait. To... are you making fun of me? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you get the sense that uh, Hitchcock spends an awful lot of time trying to conceive the perfect murder. Yes. And then deconstructing it and then yeah. seeing how the, how he can mess it up. And of course, like this is based on a book, so he didn't come up with that. But he must have fallen in love with that the minute he oh, saw it. Oh, for sure. It, you know, you if, know, if we could, you know, if he had an internet, you know, I'm sure he had like a constant search for, you know, just like <laughs> new ways to get away with murder. You know, like this is like, and it, like he was constantly kind of like well, writing short stories and notes to himself. I'm sure, you know. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, like you say, everything is in the premise in that one. It's it's a brilliant premise, and it's it's again, like you say, it deals with the anonymity, but. It also deals with just the idea of, uh, like, 
when you come close to a concept that does feel like this might be the perfect murder, mm. there's something inherently creepy about it because it's like, oh my god, people could get away with killing me and my loved ones just like that, yeah. you know? Of course, with well, it would have worked then. I don't think it would work now. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Especially since somebody would probably tweet there. Yeah, I'm coming <laughs> for you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then my last choice is, again, a classic of genre fiction, um, this time the Western, and it's High Noon with Gary Cooper and directed by Fred Zinnerman. Um, it's actually one of my favorite movies. It's, again, quite simple in terms of premise. Um, beautiful in, in the black and white uh, use here just because you just get these perfect pictures of Gary Cooper as like an aging lawman. And he's brought this town together. Everyone's behind him. And it fi you find out that people that from his past are coming into town. And ev everyone's scared. And everyone, person by person, basically just, like, leaves it. Um, so there's a lot of talk in terms of, you know, this movie being a parable to what was happening with McCarthyism mm -hmm. at the time. And what was happening, especially in Hollywood, where certain directors weren't working with certain people because of, you know, basically the Red Scare. Um and yeah, I think, a lot of, uh, during those times, a lot of uh, artists, uh, comedians, actors, directors, when they were blacklisted, yeah, flat out. Yeah, and this movie is kind of seen as one of the movies kind of like speaking about that issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just like science fiction might speak about social issues, you know, in this case, they're using the Western and getting away with it, you know, in a way. And um, it's just really well done, but it's also a really good use of like the Western as the motif where just like at the end of it, there is this showdown you know it's just like the premise isn't at the beginning it's at the end you're leading up to it it's high noon and you're just waiting for it to happen and it's all the beats that it takes as you finally get there it's um it's a great nicely put together movie mm -hmm. i um i one of the things about high noon that i've always loved I and mean, this is going to sound so stupid but it's the title i love the title high noon because it's as if the movie was calling itself there's a duel like it's a western duel like it's 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 calling itself that in that obvious a way, and yet not being nearly as clumsy and sort of almost crass about yeah, it. Yeah. It's, it's, I love that title. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. And what anyway? Just as a side note, you know, like why high noon? I guess it, is it the sun's not in either person's eyes at the point of it. Yeah, 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 that's so, why. Yeah, yeah. So, but I love that idea of just you know, like it's not at dusk, it's not in the morning, it's you know, it's like really right in the middle of the day. <laughs> In the middle of the town, usually, <laughs> you know, we're going to get together and we're going to have it off. You know? uh, interestingly, um, Richard Linklater's next before movie is Before High Noon. So oh, no, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. No, <laughs> no it's not. <laughs> before High Noon. <laughs> so, yeah, so my choices are basically a little bit genre specific the way they usually are. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, and like you said, you know, like maybe a bit <laughs> Wait a minute. you know, so. Is Harvey a genre, like well, mental it, illness uh, movie? Well, it's not that it's a genre, but it's it's almost fantastical in a way. You know what I mean? Like, it's certainly not um, no, a straight-up okay. drama. I think it falls into the 50s version of what a fringe movie is, really. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure really what the pulse of the 50s was. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like the, but it's certainly one of those decades where they really tried to create a narrative about themselves, you know? Yeah. But you mentioned the Red Scare quite a few times, and I'm wondering if that perception I have that the 50s were not as daring in terms of self-criticism, if they were, they were a lot more subtle about it, or a lot more heightened about it, and like, a, 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 you, know, you know, like the heightened emotions, so that that sort of takes over the at first glance, and I wonder if it is not because they didn't want to be perceived as anti-government, you know what I mean? It's possible, yeah. At the same time, it's what the people are going through. Maybe they just wanted to uh, escape and go watch a film and not think about everything that was going on in the world, right? Remember in the 20s, like Shirley Temple was huge because there was a huge depression and people just wanted to go see like a cute little girl like dancing and oh my god that's so cute but i mean like on, in many levels the 50s were actually a golden year for yeah. uh, for hollywood well yeah, for, for, sure. for america i should say so it is or would there be that much of a need to sort of hide from the world in that period which is why yeah i don't i don't i don't see it you know what i mean like but there's more 
of that disposable income. So it's not like you're just going to choose that one art movie. You know, yeah. you, you, it's almost like you'll try and go to several. You know, you'll maybe go three, four movies on a weekend. You know, mm -hmm. who knows? And then McDonald's. You know, <laughs> that just opened up. You know, so I think it's much more of a consumable period. You know, in terms of people just going out. You know. And, and I think that's really when it started, you know, so. Well, 1950s, it is uh, Singing in the Rain, right? Yeah. yeah. It's those so, dance yeah. movies, those Gene yeah, Kelly, the, the yeah. what was the other one, Fred Astaire? Yeah. Mm. So. Yeah, that's a whole side of the culture that I don't really know too much about. I've never been interested in mm -hmm. that, you know, so. Well, I think we're going to talk more about it in the next episode, because, spoiler people, there are musicals in, uh, in Frank and I's picks. So we'll talk about that. Uh, next time, because, uh, well, hey, I just spoiled it. Next episode, in two weeks, we'll be revealing um, Frank's picks and mine and discussing them. In the meantime, if you have any questions, comments, you want to share with us your love of On the Waterfront, you can write us at mail at idiomatic.com or post a comment at idiomatic.com. We're also on Facebook. We're also on Twitter. We're also on iTunes. And if you could please like us on Facebook, we'd really appreciate it. It allows us to get the support to continue providing you with content on a regular basis. Thanks, and see ya. Take care. This was also the time, the invention of the car, so it was the first time you basically got like teenagers driving out on their own, you know, so it's also the, the invention of the date movie. You know? Right. You know, so already, you know, you've got this element of, you know, the drive-in, the this, the that, and you really do see like pretty much a movie for every culture, every, you know, every niche in a way, mm -hmm. you know, and the other side of it is also just this sense of like the fear of the bomb. Right. that really hung over that entire generation. So it's just like there's this sense of unease and paranoia and violence that just might erupt anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. that I find in a way the noir tradition, whether it's the detective or not, you know, almost kind of taps into that as well as just kind of like this underscore of fear and, you know, paranoia of, with the general population. Mm. Without further ado, Eric, uh, why don't you get us started? Okay, so uh, I'll start number three all the way to number one. So number three, Seven Seal, the Seven Seal by uh, Ingmar Bergman. It's in black and white. Hey everybody, welcome to the Dreamers Edge podcast. This is Chris, uh, writer for the site and subtitle editor. This is Eric, teacher, sometimes writer. And I am Dimitri, Editor-in-Chief of Idiomatic.com and Movie Critic. And we've reached the point in our, like, year-long project. Now, a little <laughs> bit longer than a year. Yeah, they're about, huh? Yeah. Uh, where we've Not reached... that it was a difficult project. We just can't coordinate. <laughs> <laughs> <was> pretty much <laughs> We've reached the 50s. Uh, for those of you who haven't been following, we've been going down the decades listing our top three movies of each of those decades and we've reached the last decade where we'll be doing that because after that we'll do a special series of episodes about the rest yeah. but the 50s is the last decade we're doing but the reason why we're stopping is i think it's because the 50s like just sort of like reached that point where we're like hey we're just listing classics now yeah it's pretty much what's For going sure. on yeah, it's not like we're going down in any type of rabbit hole of, you know, look how cool I am, I know this movie, it's just like, no, <laughs> <laughs> they're classics and you know them and you like them for a reason, this is what it comes down to. Yeah, so. yeah. But although that might be a, a little bit of the 50s, though, by that point, like, the Hollywood machine had sort of cemented itself in terms of formula, like, musicals were popping in uh, all the time, and it was, it's, it was a very formulated decade for cinema. And that might be a little bit of the reason why we're like, you know. <laughs> well, you know, you've got an entire generation returning from a war, you know, and the advent of a little bit more of that suburban culture, so to speak, you know, and part of that was, you know, your weekend going out to the movies, you know, and certainly Hollywood is right there giving you something to watch, you know. <laughs> so, you know, and they did a good job. They turned it into a major industry. The 50s. As most of the 50s movies are. Uh, it takes place during the plague, the Black Plague in Europe, and it's this man that's asking all these questions about life and death, and he's playing chess against the Grim Reaper. And it's kind of interesting because the Grim Reaper is right there, all in black with this very somber face. And at first, he's kind of jokey, 
and then when we see him later on he starts to become more and more menacing um it i i like bergman a lot i think uh, the man was definitely a genius and it's the movie that i i always like more i like wild strawberries i like all of his all of his films but that one i don't know why there was something there was a high energy and when i read up on it he said that that was a fun movie he made during the summer with his friends oh. and you feel it you definitely feel it when it's up on the screen and it's kind of a dark thing too yeah. you know having the grim reaper chase you it was kind of like the prelude to final destination <laughs> <All right. laughs> Um, yeah, no, actually, I didn't know that about um, the backstory there, so it's that's kind of interesting because it's it's a good movie for sure. It's um, and it, but it's something that I've always thought of as like these just these big moving parts, like very allegorical. Yeah, you know, and not terribly deep in a way. You know what I mean? Like it's no, just like, sure. but just kind of beautiful and interesting and really kind of enjoyable to watch. You know, yeah. like like meaning not deep in terms of like, I don't know what I mean by that, but it's just in terms of nuance. You know, like these are the parts, everything's being given to you. And I, I think the black and white actually helps in this case, you know, and the, and the shadows and the silhouettes and everything. So you get this sense of like the medieval paintings and it all lends to that, um, you know, bigger than life feel to it. And yeah, no, it's 